The Nobel Conference at Gustavus Adolphus College in St. Peter, Minnesota, brings together the world's experts to explore the moral and societal implications of a cutting-edge scientific issue. Natural and social scientists, researchers, and theologians, humanities scholars, and medical doctors are among the thinkers who come together to present their latest research, engage in discussion, and explore answers to the great questions of our time. Nobel laureates and soon-to-be Nobel laureates are regularly on the roster of experts for an audience of more than 8,000 high school students, college students, industry professionals, and lifelong learners who attend the conference in Minnesota or who watch it live-streamed online. This year's conference goes in search of economic balance. The transition to a world economy has been bumpy, and the state of that economy is fragile threatened by myriad challenges, including war, refugee crises, climate change, and skyrocketing demands for consumer goods. 2016 has already seen the collapse of the Brazilian economy, the Brexit vote sending the pound tumbling, and predictions that the U.S. is headed for recession. Economists struggle to understand these complex conditions and to make sound policy proposals in light of them. Economic theorists and policy analysts dispute the causes and consequences of these events and disagree about their solutions and the trade-offs needed to bring them about. Can the prosperity enjoyed by the world's wealthiest economies be shared by all economies? Can economies grow in a way that is sustainable while also benefiting the majority of the population? Nobel Conference 52 gives viewers the opportunity to think alongside some of the world's leading economists, economic historians, and ethicists as they examine the complicated question, what is economic balance and how can we achieve it? Presenter Deirdre McCloskey is Professor Emerita of Economics, History, English, and Communication and Adjunct Professor of Philosophy and Classics at the University of Illinois at Chicago. McCloskey's academic appointment hints at the broad compass of her work, which spans scientific research and economic history, technical economics and statistical theory, philosophical work on the limits and promises of the social sciences, and writings on transgender advocacy. In the most recent volume of her widely acclaimed trilogy on bourgeois era virtues, entitled Bourgeois Equality, How Ideas, Not Capitalism or Institutions, Enriched the World, McCloskey argues that the ideas of liberalism that emerged in the 16th and 17th centuries were the real engine of what she calls the great enrichment of the 19th and 20th centuries. McCloskey is the author of 17 books. Her work has been recognized with seven honorary doctorates and the Hayek Lifetime Achievement Award. Professor McCloskey's presentation is entitled, How the World Grew Rich, The Liberal Idea, Not Accumulation or Exploitation. Well, thank you very much. I'm honored to be here, of course. I've actually taught in Sweden a lot, um, but only in English, so I can't say anything in Swedish except, hey, hey. Uh, <laughs> So I apologize for my idiocy. I'm going to s speak today about a, a project which you see the outcome of here in three books, um, which I've been ob obsessed with for 20 years. I call it the bourgeois era. And I'm using the word bourgeois to mean simply middle class, but it also is has an intent of Ma making people stop saying bad things about the bourgeoisie, about the middle class, the way a 12-year-old uh, girl who, whose father won't allow her to go on a sleepover, uh, says, she says to him, oh, daddy, you're so bourgeois. I want to get away from that. And in particular, I w want to get away from the assumption that what we normally call capitalism is corrupting. I take an ethical view. I'm, I've, uh, I'm an amateur, very amateur um, theologian. I take an ethical view of life, 
uh, not that I'm ethical, I'm afraid, I try, but you know, I, I don't succeed too well, but I try. And I, I view our market society, our society of what I prefer to call trade-tested betterment. If you want one word, innovism, innovism. That society, I think, is capable of being ethical, and indeed, largely already is ethical. It's not an ethical disaster to buy low and sell high. It's not an ethical disaster, uh, as, as Paul said, to, to show up for work as a school teacher for pay. It's not an ethical disaster to be motivated by, 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 by money, as, as John was saying. So I have three volumes that are available on Amazon.com. Uh, cheap, cheap. I'm, I'm hoping for a, for a, uh, I've, I've arguing with my editors now to try to get a boxed set. How cool is that? Like Harry Potter? makes a beautiful gift for your mother. <laughs> She'll be delighted to receive 1,700 pages in defense of a market society, which is what it is. The first volume, which, I, which was uh, published in 2006, was called, now here are the whole title, The Bourgeois Virtues. When I first proposed to speak on this at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, the secretary laughed and said, isn't that a contradiction in terms, the bourgeois virtues? And it's my, it was my initial purpose in these volumes to, to, to contradict her, to show that they're not, they're, to, to contradict her claim that it's a contradiction. Um, the Bourgeois Virtues, Ethics for an Age of Commerce. Volume two is the most economic. That first volume is, uh, is philosophical, theological, sociological. I always use a lot of examples from, from Shakespeare and Jane Austen and so forth, and I, I do that through all the books. But, but the second one's the most economic. And I go through the explanations of how we got so rich and show that the standard explanations uh, some of which you've heard in this, uh, this uh, conference, are um, at, at best partial and often quite wrong. And then the third volume, which is the, the largest, uh, uh, the, <laughs> the first two are 500 pages each, that's bad enough, but the last one is 700 pages, because I was going to do, at one point, four volumes, but then I decided, though a, tr a trilogy on this matter might be considered somewhat self-indulgent, a tetralogy is an abomination. <laughs> so three volumes is all you get. And the third volume asks how what I think caused the great enrichment, uh, as Je Jeff mentioned, how, how it came to be originally confined to Northwestern Europe, but now you see it in Botswana, you see it in Hong Kong, you see it in India and China most spectacularly. So here's, here's a brief, I'm an economic historian by scientific trade, I also do some other things, but, but economic history, is, as Jeff said, is my core field. So I'm going to give you a brief economic history of the world. And in a way, it's the most important thing I'm going to say this afternoon. So if, if there's one takeaway, it's this. Let's, let's, I, my, my finger has a remarkable feature. It, uh, you know, like a, a concert pianist will say that the music is in her hands. My finger can do scientific diagrams. They're in, it's in the finger. So here we are back at, say, the beginning of Homo uh, um, sapiens the uh, Adam and Eve, so to speak, in, in Africa. Everyone here is an African, by the way, let's get that clear. Mine, according to a uh, cheek swab I did about 10 years ago, not too informative, it said, 
your people came out of Africa about 30,000 years ago and turned left. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, more, I'm Norwegian and Irish and English, so that's not too surprising. But anyway, let's start back in 200,000 BCE and, and represent what a hunter-gatherer society got along on per person per day. And it's about three dollars. Now, try to live in, in St. Paul or St. Peter or all the other saints in the state on three dollars a day, and you're going to find it tough, particularly in, in the winter. So there you are, three dollars a day, and it goes along like this. See my, the, the trembling in my fingers, the ups and downs. Three dollars a day, three dollars a day, three dollars a day. That's 200,000 BCE. We'll make this little cross here, the present. And now we're at about 8,000 BCE. And in nine different parts of the world, completely independently, domestication of plants and animals takes place. The so-called agricultural revolution. You'd think, well, boy, that's going to change things. We'll get from $3 to, I don't know, 20 No. What happens is it goes up but then the population increases. Women are more fertile when they're, when they're well fed. Uh, uh, more children survive childhood, so population booms and we get um, civilization in the, in the literal Latin sense of the word. We get town life. We get uh, towns. And then people learn to read and so forth. Okay, so, but, so it goes back to three on Malthusian grounds, on grounds of diminishing returns to land, essentially. So then it goes along at 3, 3, 3, 3, 3. Now we're in 1800. Now it's very important that you see this and hear it. Then it goes in countries like the United States or France or then ultimately uh, South Korea and, and, uh, and, and other places. It goes like this. The sound effects are quite important. <laughs> now, how much is there? Well, as, as, as you can see from, uh, oh, from Orley's data across country, it increases by a factor of 10 at least. And in countries that have taken full advantage of the great enrichment, the innovations, and so on of the 19th century, and the, t and the 20th and the 21st, it goes up by a factor of 30 conservatively measured. Sweden, for example, mentioned one of my favorite countries. Sweden in 1800 was called, has been called, the impoverished sophisticate. Because though most people in Sweden could read, both men and, and women, because they're, they had to read the Bible, nonetheless, Sweden was the second poorest country in Europe. Uh, the only poorer country was Russia, so you can see that it was pretty bad. And then Sweden grew when it adopted liberal policies in the middle of the 19th century. Faster than any, it grew in per capita income, real per capita income from this $3. It grew faster than any country in the world except Japan in this matter. And so now, um, Swedes, Swedish national income per head, per day now, just to, so you have a scale, is $110 a day. So it went from $3 a day in modern terms, modern, we're, we're correcting for in, in inflation, uh, it went to $110. In the United States, it's about $130 a day per person. Uh, in, in Norway, which is where my people come from, because of the oil, this irritates the Swedes very much. It's $145 a day. You know, the Swedes have been accustomed for centuries to thinking of the Norwegians as their, their, their poor country cousins. And it really sticks in their craw that the Norwegians are better off. My, my grandfather, who grew up in a Norwegian-speaking community in Illinois, used to say, 10,000 Swedes went through the weeds one day at Copenhagen. 10,000 Swedes went through the weeds, all chased by one Norwegian. 
I don't know really the historical origin of that, though I'm a historian. So there's this great enrichment, and I think it's fair to call it a great enrichment, because you'll notice in my diagram, it never happened before. So the question really of, the, the first book is to establish that it's possible to be ethical, deeply so. It's possible, for example, to be a, be a Christian, as I am. Well, that doesn't mean you're deeply ethical, I'm afraid, but anyway, let's, let, let me say it. To be an Episcopalian and yet still be a, an actor in the economy. Um, that's the first book. And the, the second and third book are concerned with then this, this material consequence of the bourgeois virtues, as I call them. This amazing... Whoosh. Now, th this question that I ask, those other people that have, have spoken here, they, they're, they're talking about minor issues. I'm talking about the, mo <laughs> the most important issue in economics. Actually, we all are. All of us are. We're talking about the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. And I think most of them, most of the explanations are wrong. And I'd like to, and so, but answering that scientific question is very important. It's like, I don't know, discovering the periodic table of the elements, if you can figure it out, right? It's that important. Because maybe, and here I would want to di disagree with my new friend, John List, maybe you'll want to know why it happened two centuries ago to help you understand why it might continue to happen, as I think it will. So, we've got a factor of 10 at the minimum, factor of 30, kind of at the average, not the, the average of the rich countries, a factor of 10,000, a factor of 10,000, no, no, not a factor of 10,000, a factor of 100, a per percentage increase 10,000, if you include improvements in the quality of goods and services. Uh, medicine, for example, up until the 1920s, as Lewis Thomas, a great doctor, pointed out, it was really a bad idea to go to a doctor. Unless you had a broken arm or something that was very simple to fix. Uh, so there's been an improvement in quality, even the quality of economic analysis since 1800. So, okay, there's this enormous increase. That's what we're trying to explain. Now, here's how it's been conventionally explained. On the left, let's talk about politics here. On the left, Bernie Sanders says, it's caused by exploitation. Uh, Marx, when I was an undergraduate, at Harvard College. Bernie was an undergraduate at, at the University of Chicago, and at that point we both had the same politics. I was a Marxist, he was a Marxist. The difference is that since then Bernie hasn't changed his opinion or his facts. But okay, um, he says, and Marxists and people on the left say, that for example, Europe is rich because of imperialism. Europe is rich because it's exploiting what we once called the third world. And, or, we're rich because the working class in the early 19th century was terribly exploited. And that allowed capitalists to accumulate, and that made us rich, surprisingly, also the, the working class. Or else, slavery made America rich. This is embodied in the wonderful poetry of Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address. Um, all of those are wrong. All of those are mistaken on grounds that I could, I, I could go, go into. Let, 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 let's take imperialism as a simple example. Yes, King Leopold II of Belgium was an appalling tyrant in, in the Congo. He wanted rubber at the end of the 19th century for the new uh, applications uh, for uh, <laughs> gaskets 
in steam engines and other, it's other things, gaskets, rubber gaskets. Um, he, he wanted them for, for tires, for, for bicycles and so forth. So he took this place that he owned personally, Congo, and he sent his soldiers in uh, and they forced people to go into the jungle to tap, r tap r rubber trees. At the same time this was happening in, in uh, Amazonia. But, and you'd say, aha, Belgium was made rich by exploitation of Africa. But the trouble is that all the money from this profitable trade went to the king himself. It didn't go, not a dime, essentially not a dime went to ordinary uh, uh, Belgians in the late 19th century, late 1800s. All the money went to buy castles for King Le Leopold in the south of France and that sort of thing. So the ordinary Belgian was made no better off by this terrible, terrible exploitation. And I don't make any bones about it. This was among the worst instances of, of, of European imperialism. So far as the, as the much more extensive British Empire was concerned, it's been shown over and over again that in economic terms, it didn't matter much. Maybe or maybe not, South Asia is the, the, the jewel in the, in the crown of the, of the British Empire was damaged by imperialism. I happen to think that by now, they've probably gotten over this effect, um, but let's, let's not get into that. I'm asking what caused econ the in, in Britain. And you, you, you can see again by the example of Sweden, now I'll give a lot of Swedish examples, you can see by the example of Sweden that it can't be the possession of empire that makes a place rich. Because people got ba bananas or a curry <laughs> for their breakfast or for their dinner in Sweden just as well as they got it in Britain. It, it, it's, if, if, you, if you look closely at the accounting, it turns out that the, that the British Empire was paid by ordinary taxpayers in Britain. It was supported by ordinary taxpayers in Britain. Uh, half of the expenses of the Royal Navy went to protect the sea routes to India, coaling stations in the days in which warships ran on coal, were scattered all across the world in order that the, that the Navy, the, the British Navy, could wander around and uh, stop anyone from, from c cutting Britain off from India. But it's not as if India was some cow. It's, let's go to Wisconsin analogies. It was not as if it was some cow that was being milked all this time. That's not true. Uh, there was essentially free trade between um, uh, Britain and India. Uh, so it's not, there was not massive amounts being taken from India. Indeed, if you, if you think of the business plan of seizing a poor country like India for the benefit of a rich country like the United Kingdom, it's kind of crazy. Would you, make a, would you do well by, uh, uh, by robbing from the homeless people in your neighborhood? No, I don't think so. If, if Britain was going to uh, steal from someone, it should have stolen from France or Germany, not, not from India. But half of the, of the uh, Navy was on this assignment, and the Navy was paid for by the great British public. It was paid by taxes on beer, for example. Um, beer that was drunk mainly by poor people. And then the poor people would serve in the imperial armies to fight on the, on the northwest frontier in South Asia or uh, to fight um, the, the, the Africans armed with spears or then in the First World War and the Second. So ordinary people in Britain got nothing from the empire but the pleasure of seeing a quarter of the world's map painted red, if you include uh, Canada and uh, Australia. So, the left's story that exploitation is the key to cap what they call capitalism is mistaken. And I'll be glad to argue with someone who thinks, not argue, I'll be glad to convert 
So anyone who has the other view, if, if you think that bargaining strength is what determines wages, speak to Orly Ashenfeller and he'll tell you it's not. He'll tell you, as we've known since the 1930s, a gr great book by Hicks, The Theory of Wages, wages are determined by supply and demand, essentially. Unions, I, I belong to... I belong to the faculty union at, uh, at the University of Illinois at Chicago. When I was a kid, I belonged to the National Maritime Union. I'm in favor of unions. My whole family, I'm fond of saying, I'm the only person here, and even in a large audience like this, I'll bet you, I'm the only person here who could become an apprentice electrician in the state of, of Michigan. <laughs> I don't intend to, I must say, but I've... <laughs> But I could, because my grandfather, Fritz, my Uncle Joe, and my cousin Phil were all electricians and members of the union in a closed shop state. Uh, so I could do it. You all, sorry, you can't. And, but I, I'm not against unions. I just don't think that they cause enrichment. So it's not the struggle on the, on the picket line. A couple of years ago, I was on a picket line. I sang the old labor songs, which, by the way, I challenge anyone here to, <laughs> to uh, know more left-wing songs than I do. When I was a kid, when I was in college, I was a Joan Baez Marxist. <laughs> I, Joe Hill, I dreamt I saw Joe Hill last night, alive as you and me. Joseph Hillstrom from Sweden again. Uh, so it, it's not bargaining that got us the 40-hour the week. It's not uh, the government policies that the left wants that made us rich. They may help a little bit, but they're not. The bulk is caused by increasing marginal products, as we say in economics, increasing real wages such as Orly was talking about. Okay, so that's on the left. Is that? Oh yeah, that's the left from your point of view. Now over on the right from your point of view, the argument's also mistaken. On the right, the argument is basically, and it shares some features with the, with the left, is that it's investment that made the modern world. Now, I would challenge uh, uh, Paul C Collier on this point, although I think in the end, he, I think we actually agree on this, that investment by itself, without innovation, without what I call trade-tested betterment, without electric lights or microphones that don't work a third of the time, or or uh, wood cheaply, not cheap, but inexpensive wood, uh, such as these, these things here. The amazing projections we have here. Look, God, look at my hair. <laughs> I gotta fix my hair, this is terrible. Oh well. Um, the, <laughs> you, you know, the, this is it, this is what you get. You can't, I, I can't do any better. Um, in investment by itself doesn't accomplish anything. The, the classic case is Ghana, which received per capita a lot of foreign aid, 50s, 60s, 70s, and so forth. And Ghana started out after independence, one of the, one of the richest countries in sub-Saharan Africa, and rather quickly became one of the poorest. Um, the foreign aid didn't do anything. The pouring of, the making of artificial lakes to uh, refine bauxite into aluminum or the various plans they have didn't work because there was no real innovation behind it. There was no novelty. There was no really clever idea. Uber, which has been mentioned, is a very clever idea. And it's an idea all by itself. Once you've realized that you can do um, 
reputational tests on both sides of an, of an exchange with the, with the web and, uh, and uh, iPhones, or th then you have the whole, essentially the whole business plan of Uber. Um, so, the, so investment, uh, John Maynard Keynes, the hero of my youth after I'd started to study economics and it stopped being a bone Joan Baez Marxist, uh, John Maynard Keynes said this in his great book of 1936. He said that within a generation, the return on capital could be brought down to zero if, and this is what he was implicitly assuming, there was no innovation going on. If, look, we have this nice uh, field house here, hockey stadium, or whatever you call it. Let's see, this is a success. Let's build another one next door. And of course, the, the other one next door is not going to be as valuable as this one. Well, okay, let's do a third one. Well, down goes the return. By, probably by the fourth one, if not fourth uh, identical building like this, with no innovation, no change, no new use, the, the investment is going to be less than zero in, in, in return, right? So that basic idea, which is very fundamental to economics, of diminishing returns applies very strongly to investment by itself. Therefore, all the talk since Adam Smith, who was the first to make this kind of argument in a serious way, or Marx, I guess I should give him a other side, because the uh, main application was in Russia, um, uh, and, and Keynes, um, the, and then Walt Whitman Rostow, acquaintance of mine, uh, the idea that simply accumulating capital is what capitalism is all about is a mistake. In fact, that's one of the reasons, that's the main reason I don't like the word capitalism. Not because it was coined by the enemies of trade-tested betterment or innovism, but because it suggests very strongly to practically everyone, the people on the left, the people on the right, the people in the middle, that capitalism is all about capital accumulation. How do I know? The very word capitalism says it. I mean, what more, do you, what more, more evidence do you need? Well, it's wrong. She, humans have always accumulated capital. You go back to the uh, Oshulian hand axe of our forebearers, very much our forebearers, used for 1.3 million years among um, ho the, the genus Homo. And you find it in archaeological sites masses of these so-called hand axes. They weren't actually axes, they were used for other things. So we've been accumulating stuff forever. So that's one of the reasons why uh, accumulation of capital can't be it. Over here, the exploitation can't be it, because look, we've always exploited each other. Especially since the invention of agriculture. In hunter-gatherer communities, you can't exploit very much because the exploitee <laughs> can be knocked off very easily, can be killed if he starts misbehaving. Whereas the Lord and Lady, the Lord on his horse with a sword, he can dominate an agricultural c c community. The economist Mansur Olson, Olson called these people stationary bandits. That is, the ruling class, the priests and the, and the lords who, who collected the surplus from agriculture, um, they, they had this power through, through, through uh, violence, and uh, it had, um, uh, it, it, it's always been true. Now it's, it's the government that's the, that's the stationary bandit. Sometimes, as, as Paul would argue, for good. Sometimes, as I would argue, for bad. But anyway, they're, there's a, uh, they're, they're the ones who, who collect the surplus. So it's always happened. There's been exploitation of the surplus, agricultural surplus by these people over here, the exploitation people, and there's always been capital accumulation.
over here. Those are the historical reasons why the usual explanations don't work. Why the can't be caused by foreign trade leading to accumulation or the profits of the slave trade to go to the left again that, that caused the increase in, uh, uh, in capital. No, capital accumulation doesn't do it. And in the middle of the, this political spectrum I have here, you might talk about um, uh, institutions. The orthodoxy in the World Bank these days. Once, when I was a, a development economist, a transport economist and development economist, when early in my career, once the World Bank orthodoxy was add capital and stir. Add capital and stir. Pour investment into some country and stir it around and then you'll get economic growth. Now the orthodoxy coming from my old friend Douglas North is add institutions and stir. And I think neither of these makes a lot of sense. Because as Paul points out, the institutions need ethical support or they don't work. You can add, add all the good laws you want to Chicago a hundred years ago when everything, every, every, every policeman, every judge was for sale and you could add laws and have good institutions and it just wouldn't work. It wouldn't change anything until there was, as there has been slowly in Chicago, a change in ethics, change in the conversation that Paul was talking about, the conversation of the society, the attitude towards the corruption, towards, towards, towards. It's not so much bourgeois virtue that I think is the cause of the modern world, but a change in attitudes towards the bourgeoisie. So if these, the, and then there are economic grounds as I've described to you. For, on the left it doesn't work, on the right the diminishing marginal returns to capital you can easily show can't possibly let capital, even human capital, human capital. Education doesn't do it by itself. You can educate millions and millions of people if you don't give them the, the freedom of enterprise that they need, you'll just get more and more educated uh, unemployed people. That's what you'll get. So neither of these works and the one in the middle, the institutions, what's, what's wrong with that historically? Doug North, this man who died about a year ago, marvelous guy, uh, he said that there was a big change in the uh, quality of institutions in Britain at, or England, to be specific, for the date, in, in 1688, in the glorious revolution, which was the end of the 80-year uh, struggle between the Crown and the Parliament, and Parliament won. And Doug says that meant that now property rights were secure in Britain. And that's, to use a t technical term in economics, that's baloney. Um, property rights had always been secure in England, except during episodes such as the, uh, um, the, the, the War of the Roses. But b back to the time of Edward I, common law was in full bloom in England in property and contracts in anything you want to name. And indeed, the law only changed after, well after, the beginning of the uh, great enrichment starts around the middle of the 18th century in, 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 in England. It only start, the, the institution started changing in the 1820s and especially the 1830s and 40s. So the institutions changed after the economy started changing. So things that come after can't be the cause of things that come before. That's among the numerous problems with um, this new institutionalist story of modern economic growth, of the wheat. So dear, okay, Deirdre, stop dumping on, on my colleagues and stop complaining about uh, economic arguments that I think are wrong. What's my explanation? Well, my explanation is technology. I think Jeff 
misspoke when he said I was against technology as a cause. No, no. I, jo I joined with my friend uh, Joel Mokir, a great economic historian, and um, Jack uh, Goldstone and a bunch of other people in saying that technology is it. It's not exploitation. It's not investment. And I don't think it's changes in institutions because they don't change, and institutions anyway are often conservative. It's technology, both mechanical technology, electrical technology. Look at this uh, marvelous, cheap, I mean, handsome um, carpet here, which would be impossible in the 18th century. Uh, look at the steel on your chairs, impossible before the middle of the 19th century. Look at this, oh, my hair again, god damn. Uh, <laughs> look, look at this amazing technology. Those are the technologies, but they're also institutional improvements. Institutional improvements such as what we're in right now, the modern college. The modern college that combines research and teaching. That was invented in 2010 by a man named von Humboldt at the University of Berlin. Or take McDonald's once again. Let's talk about McDonald's. Mc, um, Ray Kroc um, invented the idea of the hamburger chain. Actually, the first idea of this was called uh, Howard Johnson's. You've never heard of Howard Johnson's, most of you. But back when I was a kid, that was the chain. But the, the, it was an institutional innovation that McDonald made, that, uh, that Kroc made. By, by the way, his, his, his widow has given the money to NPR, which I think is great. So, so the institutional change, the investment, is necessary. You've got to embody this, um, what would you call it, this movie system we have back here in, in actual stuff that you have to invest in. But it was the ideas for it, the idea in Ray Kroc's mind, the, the idea of, of a research university, those came first. The idea of a new spinning machine, the idea of a steam engine, the idea of electricity, the transistor, et cetera, et cetera. Now this, this in a way, this is a completely obvious point. Once you've gotten over thinking that it's either exploitation or investment or institutional change and can look at what it actually was in the 18th, 19th, and 20th century, it's pretty obvious, as uh, Paul Romer, a student of mine at the University of Chicago, has said, it's pretty obvious that ideas for technological improvement or institutional improvement come from people's brains. I mean, where else are they going to come from? Outer space? They come from people's brains. So that's the first point completely obvious in my explanation. But the big question is why all of a sudden, in the, after 1800 especially, in many countries, and in, in an increasing number of countries, people, as Jeff mentioned, have a go. Why did so many people start thinking of innovations? An, an example that I have in mind, have had in mind for, for decades, there's an exhibition at the Wisconsin Historical Society about 40 years ago, maybe even longer, about 40, um, of cherry pitters. <laughs> These, Wisconsin was not a, a dairy economy um, in the 19th century mainly. It was a fruit growing economy. There were a lot of fruit orchards and people grew cherries. And then they had the long Wisconsin winter to think of ways of getting the pit out of the cherry. And in this exhibition, I'm not making this up, hear this. In this exhibition, there were 200 cherry pitters of various designs. 
200. Now this is loco. <laughs> this is pazzo. This is insane. Heck, as we say in Dutch. Meshugana. Come on. 200 cherry pitters. But that's ordinary people having a go. So the key is that a mass of people feel entitled, feel empowered to open a hairdressing salon or start a computer business in their garage or uh, invent the Chicago uh, Board of Trade. Ordinary people, because if it's just a bunch of elite, I don't know, college professors or uh, or something, it's not, it's not going to work. It's, there's not, that had happened before. Innovation has been a, something uh, homo sapiens have been doing forever, but nothing like the volume that they did after 1800. Okay, why the change? Why rather suddenly after 1800, starting in northwestern Europe and spreading to the world, did we get this crazy, outburst of invention. My friend Matt uh, uh, Ridley, an English uh, science journalist, calls it ideas having sex. <laughs> so I know it's kind of, kind of vulgar, but I can't help it, neither can he. Um, you invent rather obviously to get coal out of horizontal uh, mines in northeastern England. You invent rail cars that you push, or the pregnant women drag or something, along rails to get the coal out. And then you invent the high-pressure steam engine. The atmospheric engine won't do it. It has to be high-pressure. And then you put the two together. They have sex, and you get the railway. And then there are little baby ideas of the railway. And they have sex with each other. And everyone, the grandbaby ideas, and the great-grand, and you get this enormous explosion because ordinary people are having a go. As Walt Whitman said, I contain multitudes. I contain multitudes. And he did. He and, and, and Americans. Now, why did that happen? It happened because of what is properly called liberalism. Not the way it's used in the United States and in Britain, uh, especially in the United States, to mean slow socialism. Uh, I'm, I was once a socialist, so I, I sympathize with this error, but, but I, it's an error nonetheless. Liberalism is what Adam Smith called the liberal plan now hear this, of equality, liberty, and justice. Equality before the law and in, uh, um, uh, let, me, let me see, let's get this right. Equality of social standing, liberty to open a business. Look what happened in China after 1978 when the Communist Party started allowing people to open business. And... Um, uh, justice, that is equal justice before the law, the, the motto on our Supreme Court. So that's it. It's, 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 a, it's a species of equality, I call it Scottish equality. To contrast it with uh, uh, Rousseau's French equality, which is equality of outcome. I've written a long review of um, Thomas P P Piketty's big book on capital in, in the 21st um, century, in which I, I treat the book with respect. It's a serious book. But I conclude after 50 pages that it's wrong, and that equality is not our problem. Our problem is raising up the poor. The problem is poverty, not equality of outcome. The problem is the, the failure of the, uh, uh, the failure uh, of the public schools that John was speaking of to, to give everyone uh, a proper start in life. So, liberalism is what made us rich. 
It's also what made us free, I mean, more or less by, by, by definition. This is an 18th century idea. The clerisy, as I call them, the intellectuals and the artists, the theologians and the novelists, since the 18th century have had three ideas, three ideas about society. One was this liberalism. So Voltaire and Ben Franklin, Mary Wollstonecraft, Tom Paine, that's, that's liberalism. The other two ideas were just terrible. Socialism and nationalism. Nationalism came first, then socialism. And if you like nationalism or socialism, maybe you'll like national socialism. That is fascism. Uh, you know, you need to consider whether that's the kind of world you want. And the liberal idea turned out to be correct. It turned out to be that when you had the liberal plan of um, equality, equality, liberty, and justice, you inspirited masses of people to have a go, to try out um, trade-tested betterment that's accounted for the wheat. Now, why was that? Why did it happen in Northwest um, Europe? Is this more Eurocentric pride? Pride, the chief sin against the Holy Spirit? No, it's not. It's, it's very, it was, it was a close thing. Could easily have gone the other way. In, in 1500, if anyone could have conceived a factor of 10 or 30 or 100 increase in real income per head for ordinary people, they would have bet on China, because China made most of the world's inventions. We once used to think that uh, the blast furnace was a Swedish invention, and no, it wasn't, it was Chinese. We tend to think of the printing press as a German invention, no, it wasn't, it was Chinese, etc. China had an enormous free trade area, low taxation. It had a comparatively educated population, at least by comparison with, uh, with, with Europe at the time. Um, and it had, uh, uh, what else? Oh, it had most of the world's uh, a panoply. Most things were invented in China, and you would have thought it's going to go on, China's going to be the place. But no, it was this crummy little corner of the Eurasian landmass called Northwestern Europe. And I emphasize that. It wasn't in Italy, where on internal European grounds you would have supposed that economic development would start taking place. No, it was around the North Sea. Holland, to, to begin with, the Dutch. Then England, when it got a, a Dutch king. Then Scotland, when it uh, escaped from, from, from strict Calvinism. The English-American colonies, North American colonies, uh, then Belgium, northern France, etc., etc. It gets, it spreads. But it's northwestern Europe. In fact, excepting Holland, and there's some, actually, some involvement of Sweden in this, but not much. Excepting Holland, it's the Anglosphere. It's the English-speaking world. Now, why, why there? Well, it's not because of some ancient English or European superiority. It's not science, for example. Joe Mokir argues it's the scientific revolution. I don't think so. I think now the scientific, sci high science, is terribly, terribly important for economic growth, for further economic growth. But in the 18th and 19th century, indeed, in most parts of the economy, well in, into the 20th century, it's technologists, tinkerers, skilled machinists, people who are not doing uh, thermodynamics or something. It's not high science, it's, it's low technology that made the modern world. And certainly the institutional um, the, 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 the developments have very little to do with high science. So it's not science, it's not English common law, as uh, some of my colleagues think. 
uh, Asimoglu and so on, they think it's that. No, no, um, because it didn't happen in Britain. Now properly called Britain with the Act of, of Union until the 18th uh, century. So what was it? It was accidents of Northwestern European politics and social change, especially politics. The Reformation, not the way Max Weber claimed it as the a change in the doctrine of salvation, but because of a change in radical Protestantism, not the kind I espouse or the Lutherans or the Catholics, and certainly not the Catholics espouse, not a hierarchical church, but a democratic church. Congregationalists, extreme example in the 17th century, are Quakers who have no minister at all. If you've been to a Quaker meeting, they sit around in a circle until the Holy Spirit uh, descends. Uh, reading, not a German invention, but that the printing press was crucial to the success of the, uh, uh, of the Reformation. Martin Luther's address to the nobles of the German uh, nation, this highly radical pamphlet against the Pope. In its first week, 4,000 copies. In its second week, another 4,000 copies. Within two weeks, 8,000 copies of this revolutionary pamphlet on the order of the, of the Communist Manifesto was circulating in Germany, in German. Revolt. The successful Dutch revolt against Spain, which was the North northern low countries, what we could conventionally call Holland, against the largest and best army in Europe, namely the Spanish army. And they, in a, in a 80 years war, it actually didn't really last that long, but it's called the 80 years revolt, they finally won. That made people bold. The English Revolution, you can call it, the English Civil War of the 1640s, made people bold. The English Revolution, uh, the, the Glorious Revolution, 1688 I've mentioned, made people bold. The American Revolution, you know about that, the French Re Revolution, 1789. All these could have gone the other way without Martin Luther, without um, well, maybe even without Gutenberg, but certainly without Oliver Cromwell, without uh, King William of the uh, 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 William and Mary, without George Washington, who finally learned how to fight, without the French Navy intervening uh, at, at the right points, without, without, without. It could, it could easily have gone the other way. That's why I call it an accident. So by an accident of history, Northwestern Europe became somewhat liberal. Now understand, <laughs> the United States was a slave society well into this, this event. So I'm not saying that these were perfectly liberal societies, but they were more liberal than the alternatives. There were societies in which ordinary people could have a go and wanted to have a go. So I'm going to make a bold claim, and th then I'm going to sit down. I think I've solved the central question in economics. <laughs> and if you don't believe me, buy the books and read them. Anyway, buy them. <laughs> and it is that ideas, as I say in the, in the subtitle of the third volume, ideas, not capital or institutions, enrich the world. And if I had had my wits about me, I would have sold more copies. I've sold a fair number already. I'm glad to hear you be glad to hear it. This last volume came out last spring, this spring. Uh, if I'd had my wits about me, I would have said, I would have added one more word. 
I would, said, I would have said, how liberal ideas, not capital or institutions, enriched the world. Thank you very much.